Okay, thank you, Kadi, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a new line of research uh, that I've started, which looks into the dynamics of academic workforce. And for those of you who looked at the program, the subtitle was something long about attrition rates and what it does to the science as a whole. And I was, as I was working more on this, the title might have been the better subtitle might have been the rise of the sub-scientist, but that will be explained shortly. Anyway, uh, and we've heard some of this actually in the previous one, the growth of knowledge and how fast it grows. So we all know that we live in the world where pretty much everything that's connected to science grows exponentially. So here you see the growth of publications. So this is based on a whole web of science and we see the doubling time. So yes, publications are growing exponentially and that is the result of the growing workforce but also the focus uh, on productivity that we have all been experiencing for a number of different reasons. We are also, living and working, as has been mentioned a lot, in the team-based science, right? So you could see here, again, this is based on whole web of science, uh, how the world of producing knowledge looked like through a period, and not only that we have uh, fewer single authors, but the teams that engage are getting larger and larger. So uh, you can see that. And, and that has very serious implications, as a lot of uh, the others have mentioned, for a number of things, uh, both for how we do research, but also, uh, as I'm going to argue, for education. And again, one thing when it comes to discussing growth of the scientific labor force uh, is this gap or this discrepancy be between the number of new PhDs and the number of available um, positions which are more uh, permanent, like a lot of the focus is on the tenure track jobs, but again, it may be a wider array of jobs. Um, some of them have like ideally would have more stability, such as a permanent research or staff scientists that could continue contributing knowledge, but in, again, more stable environment. So when people uh, talk about the crisis in uh, higher ed, when it comes to the um, scientific labor force, they usually look into this statistic, which is this discrepancy. Uh, and we've heard about the bubble, uh, but if you look <laughs> at some of the news about the workforce, uh, there is a lot of this. So we have pyramid schemes, we have booms and busts, uh, we have leaky pipelines, not only gender-wise, but otherwise. Uh, we do not talk about the uh, PhD as more of a craft, it's just a factory. Uh, and uh, even popular papers were um, questioning the, the, how valuable a PhD is or should we stop producing as many PhDs uh, as we do. So what I'm going to actually do here, I will try and look uh, into this idea of scientific careers, but more through the organizational studies lens. And these are the three of the main factors that I will focus on. And the first one has to do with the fact that, again, science is done in larger team sizes, which means really what is happening is increased division of labor and standardization that is being brought. And these two things are leading, and again, uh, Ben Jones and some of the others were mentioning a higher specialization. And higher specialization is really important for bringing fundamental changes uh, to the scientific work, but also to the scientific workforce. Another thing is the transitions from the science organization, which is based on the craft principle. So a craft principle would be one when you have apprentice, journeyman, and master sort of thing. Uh, to the one that's based more on the bureaucratic industrial principles. Uh, and again, this idea is not new, it goes back to the 60s, but uh, there has been a recent paper that actually, um, and it's called the bureaucratization of science, which really uh, tried to say, well, we might have entered the age where science did become bureaucratized, and we can see uh, um, or these are the possible traces, and one of them is specialization. And finally, there are these tensions which are, which are well known uh, between the research production and teaching functions of the research universities. And this becomes important because labs should provide both. And there is this tension where as a lab leader, uh, your productivity, like what is best for your productivity or the productivity of the lab as a whole and the efficiency is not necessarily best for educating a student as a whole, right? It's more, Efficient is the student who is really good at extracting a gene continues doing that versus really getting a broader picture. And, and this tension, again, is nothing novel, but um, by, by doing this analysis, I think uh, I might have identified 
some of the things that we are now seeing if we look uh, into the data. So a broader question that I tried to answer was what leads to a successful career? And how is this different from the talks we heard here? A lot of the talks, uh, and that's very valuable, and there is a very um, fruitful line of research. Quite a few of you actually were engaged in, in this, and some of this we heard this morning, and that's very valuable uh, to understand what is a successful career of researchers who are already in the system, right? So we look uh, usually at the people who have tenure track jobs, uh, and then we want to make uh, sure to see what makes them success, uh, successful and uh, other particular models. Here, I'm going to kind of look not only uh, through those who made it, but really to whole, uh, like, so my unit of analysis is academic cohort. So I want to look at all of the people who published any paper in any given year and see what happens to the whole cohort, right? So I'm expanding that to people who never made it beyond a single paper. And that may be important because then my uh, def definition of success, it's not so much who gets a lot of citations, it's really who survives in this game longer, right? Who has this longevity of the career, uh, which is the precondition <laughs> of getting citations, right? Because you need to have conditions to continue. Um, I looked into this uh, in uh, via three disciplines, and I chose those because, like for a number of reasons, one is, um, I think they are a good sample of different ways that science is being conducted. So we have astronomy, which is more traditional. Uh, again, it's very interesting because when we talk about alternative careers, that one is not really clear of how you can continue being an astronomer and have an alternative career. And the other two, ecology and robotics, um, a different like uh, ecology, more interdisciplinary, and has like this flavor of how bio, bio sciences are done in robotics, techno technological one. Again, both of these have a more clear paths to the alternative careers, um, especially in the industry and uh, nonprofit and, and other factors. Um, Another reason for doing this is I'm very familiar with all three. I've done research there, so the data set I had has been cleaned, so I could really uh, apply or test these ideas on them. Uh, once, uh, for the career, it's important to do nameless ambiguation, so I did not, um, I did that, so I used the hybrid initial methods um, that I tested years ago, uh, and um, it does have a, a fairly good accuracy determination. Um, and another novelty is, and that's something that Laszlo actually mentioned uh, this morning, that he's working on a model of how we attribute credit, where we know that these teams uh, produce research, but we don't necessarily know who they did what. And actually, Biagioli, who is writing about authorship, is saying that authorship is less and less collaboration between equal scientist peers like we are having different tiers of people collaborate, like contributing, and we need to disentangle that. So we need to move away from the idea that everybody in a team is equal and it's peer. So the way I worked around that is uh, the idea of a lead author, and again, this is field dependent, and I know you could say, well, in other fields it doesn't work like that, and I know, but in these fields I tested, so the first author, uh, the norm is for these fields that the first author is usually a lead author. Uh, the way I tested this was for the corresponding author as well, and in the majority of cases, the corresponding and the first in these three fields were the same. Uh, just to be precautious, whenever there was an alphabetical order, um, if the, the first person alphabetically coincided with the <laughs> corresponding, I discarded all of these papers because I couldn't really know for sure whether it just the agreement, because uh, this is in a large, like very, very large collaborations, and sometimes they do have the agreements that it's always the first individual, and I couldn't tease that out. That left only a few percentages, so it shouldn't have really significantly affected the analysis. And I'm going to start of this, and I know it's sub-scientist, it's pejorative, but it's a term that was used in, in that paper, and the idea is that some scientists are people who never become lead authors, right? So they write papers, but they are always team members. They are permanent team members. They're never a first author. They're never a corresponding author. They just are a middle author. 
And it's, it's very interesting that we are seeing a significant rise in these permanent team members. And one of the reasons may be this specialization, right? Because if you are a, a member of a lab, you may really not get all of the skills that you need that would help you uh, become that PI and lead your own group. And that really is saying that we need to look more closely in this idealized version that we have of apprenticeship journeyman, uh, journeyman master, right? Where it may not be that apprenticeship is what it was and, and uh, there may be something missing. And you could see here that those um, Permanent team members, and again, uh, teams were smaller, but it doesn't matter because even now when you produce more papers, eventually you should maybe made it to the first authorship. Uh, now, 60% of all of the people who contribute never become PIs. Um, there is this idea of transient authors, and it was put forward by Price, who said, well, if you, in, in the 60s, he looked into all of the authors and has said, well, a lot of them just come in and they get out, they have a single paper, and, like, and there is half of them. Well, I looked, so of all of the people who were not transients, and transients are people who just contribute a single paper and they are out. Of all of the people who have multiple papers, I then looked how many of those that had multiple papers were actually lead authors uh, versus um, permanent team members. And we see that the percentage is slightly lower, but the transition, like the transient nature does not explain uh, the, the fact that we are seeing so many permanent team members. Uh, it's interesting to look at the transients themselves. So actually quite a few transients were lead authors, and it may be the case that they were authors on a single author paper. They might have had a single paper with an advisor, as an advisor pair, like what they were the first ones. So, uh, but uh, you see in certain fields such as astronomy, uh, their contribution through time remain um, fairly stable, where in the recent years we do see a rise uh, in uh, ecology and robotics uh, in uh, this population of transients. So the second thing that I looked, uh, that I wanted to look at is the career longevity, right? But this is taking into account the whole cohort, like when you published uh, that first paper until you were still active. Uh, and again, uh, there have been models, <laughs> some of those developed by uh, people in the audience on the career lengths, and um, they, uh, according to the models, you have a, a roughly power law distribution with the exponential cutoff that we are not seeing here, but it may be the uh, factor of the time uh, because we didn't reach uh, mm -hmm. uh, zero in the data that I had. Uh, and uh, again, you do see um, this drop, right, uh, after around the, the 10 years. Uh, if you take a separate look uh, at the lead authors and non-lead authors, I think this is very interesting. Um, and this is telling us that people who are non-lead authors, um, and this goes with the postdoc idea, right? So you do see that uh, non-leaders, and transients are excluded because we will have even higher peak on one, right? And we didn't, like, I didn't want that. Uh, so, if you look here um, at the sub-scientists or people who are never lead authors, you see that uh, not too many of them work up beyond the 10-year mark. And it does make sense, right? If they published as they were in grad school, they got one postdoc, they maybe extended that one, they got another postdoc. <laughs> maybe a third postdoc, and then they hit that wall because there aren't that many positions for permanent staff scientists where they could support somebody's lab, but more in the long term. Uh, there are some of those because some of them tend to have longer careers, but overall you see that that may not be an option for, for that uh, community. Uh, what is very interesting here is the attrition rate uh, and uh, for the field as a whole, for these three fields, and how that has changed over time. So in all three fields, we actually do see uh, that the, like the acceleration, people are dropping out of each of those fields quicker and quicker. Uh, but you can see the quickest attrition rate is in robotics. So it's, what's very interesting here is, if you look at robotics and ecology, fields that I said, would have more meaningful alternative career for those people, they tend to leave quicker, yes. 
um, which makes sense. They can still contribute, like they can develop technology, they can utilize the skills. Uh, so they may decide after the first post that they're not successful in that and they, they leave much quicker. So I think this is also uh, very interesting uh, to see uh, the changes in attrition. Uh, another thing that one may want to look then is, well, what makes one successful? Meaning like, w how can one survive longer? And are there any characteristics that we, these uh, individuals who have longer careers have versus the other ones in this uh, initial five years uh, of their career? So what I looked was at was the productivity in the first five years, citations to the early lead author publications. Uh, level of interdisciplinarity of their early lead author works, and the number of different direct collaborators that have in the five years. Uh, and again, this is the uh, raw numbers, and uh, for this one I focused only on astronomy and ecology, uh, because for robotics, I didn't have a long enough period that I can actually follow this, so I looked at the cohorts that started in the baseline in the 70s and 80s uh, and see what happened in there. So this here is, you see, um, for the first five years of those careers, the one who have longer careers tended to be more productive early on. Those two dots at the end were scientists who are still active uh, at the time, so these are the ones who haven't retired. Uh, and you can see that the trend uh, stays. So. Uh, so productivity or early productivity does seem uh, to be um, um, a factor. If you look at the early impact, that's not such an important thing as the productivity, uh, at least uh, in, in for the longevity of the career. And that may be the case that, again, the Q factor has shown that uh, like pe people with different Q factors have that, ha can have different length of the career. So it doesn't mean uh, that the number of citation necessarily, and it doesn't show that it was an impact. What is really interesting is interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity doesn't seem to affect it one way or another. If anything, early interdisciplinarity may somewhat hurt people in, uh, more in ecology than in astronomy. But again, it's a fairly weak uh, signal. And again, it's something that we know like focus, focusing on a single line of research may be better for uh, creating one's visibility in, in a community. Uh, and what is really interesting and what makes a big difference is your early level of collaboration. So it seems that all of the factors, how collaborative you are early on in your work has the highest impact on how long your career is. And again, uh, this may be the fact uh, of just the network effect in terms of how many people you know, and then it's this idea that people trust people they had a chance of working with uh, previously. So if you worked with a lot of people, they had a chance to test how you are uh, in the work environment. Another thing, this may be a signal of the type of projects these students pick, uh, because if they have lots of the lead collaborators, they may be on larger projects that may be working on more attractive topics in that time. Uh, so one would have to tease out where the collaboration itself comes from, but that is the most important factor for the longevity. So if you're looking at this fact for these factors, number of different collaborators seems to be the most important thing. Productivity, the next one, and then the citations and level of interdisciplinarity does not seem uh, to affect this so much. So again, what I <coughs> presented here in a way that this way in which science is now produced with team science and not only team science, but larger and larger teams producing science and also this focus on productivity that we have is not only affecting uh, the way we produce knowledge and consume knowledge, there have been studies of that, but it really can affect the workforce itself and what is happening to people. Um, it's very interesting that smaller fraction of new authors end up as PI, so uh, um, again, we do see this rise of uh, sub-scientists and it may be that they are too specialized to be uh, able to have other skills. Um, again, transients are still not dominant fraction of the authors. It's very interesting that that is uh, being in check. Uh, and, but we are seeing increasing rates of attrition uh, throughout. And again, it's not that these people are not contributing knowledge, it's just that they are not contributing to the publication. So uh, it's not to say that they are not very productive in uh, R&D and in other areas, but they are really not uh, in the communication of science via publication, they become invisible. Um, and again, this is trying to propose that uh, we should look into the longevity because again, in order to accrue 
citations and publications, you still, you know, like you need to be alive, like you need to continue contributing and, and like a lot of people do not. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to look more closely uh, in those early career factors uh, that may uh, contribute to that. As I said, what, what I've shown you are um, some of the early analysis, so like this should do more work, and again, some of these factors may be uh, co-founded, so like teasing some of those out, but I think it's interesting to see that which ones seem to be a better signal for what is happening. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to conclude. So any suggestions and comments, welcome. <laughs>